You'll find it fairly early in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I'd like to do something a little different this morning. Um, I don't normally preach a sermon this way, but I'm not actually going to read the text. I'm going to tell you the story that it contains. As you know, if you've been here for any length of time, I've told you before, Mother's Day is my least favorite sermon of the year. Obviously, I am ill-equipped to preach a sermon to women, or to mothers, or to grandmothers. But if we look to Scripture, we find a woman named Hannah. And I believe Hannah is a worthy example, not only for the ladies, but for all of us. She lived a wonderful life and did some amazing things. She was, in fact, the mother of Samuel, who was perhaps the first great prophet of Israel. And he was one who transcended uh, the, the spiritual and the political in a good way. And he became a leader in the land of Israel. And so in the days before Israel had a king, a man named Elkanah lived in the hill country of Ephraim. This is about 25 miles north of Jerusalem. And although he lived in the land of Ephraim, Elkanah was in fact a Levite, a member of the priestly tribe. And although it was never sanctioned by God, it was common in those days for men to take more than one wife. And Elkanah was married to two women, Hannah and Peninnah. Now, Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. And it is not whether or not a woman has children that increases or decreases her created work. We must add that. But it was terribly difficult for Hannah in her culture. We have to remember, Scripture was written and all of these events occurred in a culture very much different than our own. It was difficult for, for Hannah because a woman in those days had value in her culture based on her ability to produce children. Penina made things worse for Hannah by provoking her, the Scripture says, in order to irritate her because Penina had children, and Hannah did not. But Hannah, it seems, was Elkanah's favorite. He favored Hannah over Peninnah. And Scripture says whenever the day came for Elkanah to give a sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her. Now in spite of this, Hannah endured tremendous emotional and mental anguish. Again and again she wept and she prayed and she pleaded with God. But she had no child. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, this is where Elkanah went to offer sacrifices to God, Hannah stood up and in her deep anguish she prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She prayed so hard, in fact, that words did not come. Only her lips moved. And the priest Eli thought she was intoxicated. She said, oh no, I'm not intoxicated. I'm pleading with God. And in her prayer, she vowed to the Lord, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will be used on his head. Now that last little segment indicates Hannah was entering into what was called a Nazarite vow. And I won't go deeply into that for the sake of time, but suffice to say, a Nazarite vow was a vow before God going to a deeper level in one's relationship with him. Samson also took a Nazarite vow. And it involved not cutting the hair, not shaving, but it also involved not partaking of any fruit from the grapevine, including wine, and other never touching anything that was dead. And Elkanah, in essence, 
promised God she would take her child and give the child back to the Lord. That was her vow. Now, in the course of time, because we're on this end of history, we know God answered Hannah's prayer. And she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, which meant, I asked the Lord for him. And after the child was weaned, Hannah took him, as young as he was, along with a sacrificial offering, and brought him to the house of God at Shiloh. And she presented him to the priest Eli and left him there according to the promise she made with God. Now there's a great deal, as I said, for all of us to learn from Hannah's worthy example. Not just moms and grandmothers, but all of us. And so I encourage you to keep the scripture open. And if you haven't already done so, go ahead and open it to 1 Samuel 1 as we break this down into an outline of W's. First of all, we must establish the intrinsic worth of a person. That's the first of those W's, the worth of a person. Hannah had intrinsic worth as a woman that transcended being a wife or a mother, even though the culture of her day did not recognize that. As I've already shared, because of the matriarchal, uh, I'm sorry, the patriarchal nature of the culture in her day, Hannah's identity was wrapped up in Elkanah's. And because a Hebrew man's posterity depended on having a son to perpetuate his name, a wife's inability to conceive was actually seen as a curse. Now, I'm not saying that's correct. You can have an entire large group of people who believe something passionately and are totally wrong. And that was the case. This was not a curse. Hannah was precious in God's eyes. Much the same as each of us are. She was created in God's image, carefully and extravagantly. Remember David wrote, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made and your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And those of you who have been with us for the last several weeks or months know that I have covered that particular scripture and that point again and again and again. Why do we keep coming back to the fact that you and I are made carefully and extravagantly in God's image? Because there are still lots of folks that need to hear it. We live in a culture that does not promote that. That does not promote the value of each individual. And as people of God, we must remind women again and again and again, you are created carefully and extravagantly in God's image. You have an intrinsic worth that nothing can change. We must remind black people and Asian people and Hispanic people, you have intrinsic worth and a beauty that comes from God that cannot be taken away. We must remind school children and those who get up for work every morning, as well as those who can't find a job, your humanity is endowed by God with worth that does not fluctuate on what you do for a living or where you live or what situation you find yourself in. All the power of a human being who begins to see themselves as created in God's image, carefully and extravagantly made by a loving God. You and I are the church, the body of Christ, and we must continuously affirm the worth of every individual to one another as we encourage one another and also to others, especially those who perhaps have forgotten or had circumstances remove their sense of worth in God's eyes. Secondly, there is weeping that becomes worship. This is 
a bonus, two W's in one point. Hannah, it seems, spent a lot of time weeping. She desperately wanted to be a mother, and she wept because she could not conceive a child. She wept because Penina provoked her in order to irritate. Is there anybody that gets under your skin? And I don't know, but some folks react tearfully when they're feeling angry or when they're feeling embarrassed or belittled. This was the case with Hannah. But when the tears began to flow, when weeping began, Hannah somehow moved into worship from that point. Which is an example for all of us to at least consider. When tears begin to flow, when weeping begins, let it go. Let the tears come. Let God use them to minister to you, to encourage you, to lift you up. Allow the weeping to become worship. Hannah had her weeping become worship as she had continued to accompany Elkanah, her husband, year after year after year to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty. Now because we can read this chapter in a relatively short time, it might seem that one day Hannah prayed to God, ah, bless me, allow me to have a child, and the next day she did. Any woman who has ever carried a child knows it does not work that way. And so we're talking not just months, we're talking years, where she continued to go back and worship. She continued to weep before the Lord. She continued to serve Him, and she continued to pray. Her weeping became worship, and she poured her heart out to God, which teaches us that God sees our tears. And I know some of us are feeling pretty good today. Others of us are facing a challenge. We're dealing with tears today. I don't want to focus attention only on myself, but it was one year ago today that my mom passed. This is a tough Mother's Day. And some of you know what that feels like. You know how that experience goes. But you see, God keeps a record of our tears. He is present with us. He is able to to allow us to move into worship if we will do so. Like Hannah, our weeping becomes worship as our hearts break before God and we pour ourselves out to Him. We open ourselves up to Him. We can be vulnerable to God and it's safe to do so. I know some of you have been vulnerable with other people and it didn't go so well. Never evaluate God on the actions of his children. For as human beings, we're all imperfect. We will fail, even the best of us. But our God is faithful. Third, Hannah prayed prayer that did not waver. In her deep anguish, the text tells us, she prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and I already shared, she prayed so intensely and so fervently that just her lips moved. Words did not come. I'm always a little concerned about those who feel that because they cannot pray out loud with words such as we do in a worship celebration, don't pray at all. Every one of us is, as my friend Leroy Jolly put it, a good prayer. That's not great grammar, I recognize. But you are all good prayers because the God who loves you sees your heart, is connected with your spirit, and any prayer that you offer Him honestly and openly, regardless of its eloquence, regardless of whether or not you're comfortable praying it out loud in front of others, is a good prayer. Prayer must not waver. Hannah prayed fervently and passionately. 
She kept praying and praying and praying. We have no idea how long. We don't know how long we prayed or she prayed. We know it must have been a while because Penina had multiple children. And so some time has passed as Hannah continues to pray regarding this situation. She continued to come to the Lord even though an answer did not come. In the church that I grew up in, we used to call this praying through. I don't know if we use that phrase all that much anymore. And I don't know if it was ever uh, a phrase used in the congregational tradition, but it's the idea that I will continue to come before the Lord until I get an answer of some kind. Sometimes we must not waver in our prayers. We must be tenacious. That is in fact what Paul meant when he said pray continuously. Pray without ceasing, it says in some translations of 1 Thessalonians 5.17. It would be ridiculous for us to pray continuously every minute of every day. That makes no sense. And if anything, Scripture does make sense when we consider it and look at it allowing the Spirit to teach us. Paul was describing a mindset that says, I will continue to come before the Lord until I get an answer. Not necessarily the answer I want, but an answer. Pray continuously. Keep going back to God again and again and again. Keep praying. I know some of you have been dealing with things in your own life, maybe things that are too personal to share, even with us, your church family. And that's fine. Keep praying. Maybe you've got those children that have drifted. Or you've got a situation in your, in your work that has been bad for years. Continue to pray. Keep coming back. Keep praying. And no matter what comes, no matter how long it takes, and no matter what answers you do not seem to get, know that God hears you and keep praying and do not waver. And then finally, the last W is willingness. And I caution you, this one is hard. Willingness to give God our most precious. I can't help but think of the character Gollum from the Lord of the Rings uh, books and movies. Uh, some of you are more familiar with the movies than you are with the books. Gollum had this ring that he called his precious. And it was the thing that he held most, close, most tightly. It was the thing that was, in fact, most precious to him. Bear that image in mind while we consider Hannah. Remember, she made a vow to God that she would take the child, if he gave her a child, and bring the child back to God and give it to him. And then God answered her prayer. And here's Hannah. And any parent understands this. I remember when each one of my children was born. And I held them there in that delivery room for the first time. I remember none of our kids cried. But boy, I did. I wept. And this person that I did not yet even know was absolutely most precious to me. Do anything for that child. Those of you who are parents understand that immediate transition that takes place. And maybe it's a little different for men than it is for women because we don't carry the babies. And I know there's a connection for moms especially. But for me, that connection was cemented in that moment, in that delivery room when I held each one of our kids. How must Hannah have felt? She has this child that she asked God for. And then she went back to the priest Eli and said, I pray for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. 
So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. How hard must that have been? Have you ever had to release something precious to God? No, understand. Hannah did not give Samuel to Eli and then walk away never to be part of his life. That wasn't the case. Hannah was, in fact, part of Eli's life going forward. She still saw him. She was still his mom. She, and, and he knew that she was her mom. And they had a relationship. But he lived and grew up in the temple at Shiloh, serving God. Hmm. Sometimes you and I have to be careful because those things that are most precious can make us a little bit like that Gollum character. They can change us and warp us. If we hold them so tightly that it somehow affects our relationship with God. Even our kids can do that. And any of you adult children know that there comes a time when, boy, you have to start, you have to start pulling back. You have to start releasing them. And that relationship changes. You and I hold tightly to that which we consider most precious. And we are careful with it because we fear we cannot trust it to anyone else. Whether it's a child or something else. We hold it closely because we don't want to lose it. Abraham must have experienced some of this when God told him to sacrifice Isaac. And of course, we have the luxury of reading about Abraham on this end of history. So we read that story and we say, well, no big deal. We know how it ended. God provided a different sacrifice. He never intended for Abraham to, to kill his son. He was testing his willingness to lay everything out before God. But how must Abraham must have felt? How must Hannah have felt? I assure you, as I have to assure myself daily, to have a willingness to give God our most precious is a huge step toward a deeper, more intimate relationship with Him. Give Him your dreams. See what He does with them. Give Him your family, the kids. Your grandkids, your marriage, all of it. And see how he blesses. Give him, if you dare, your life. And see what he does with it. He can be trusted. Part of our issue is we continue to evaluate God based on the actions of other humans around us. Can you and I be trusted? Not always. For we're fallible. We'll mess up. We'll drop the ball. But God never has and never will. And He can be trusted. And as God's children, our willingness to give Him that which is most precious, to surrender it all to Him, ushers us into a deeper relationship with Him and opens the way for tremendous blessings in this life as well as the next. My experience is God does not necessarily remove from us those things that we give Him. We give Him our family. We still have a family, but it's His to do with what He chooses, and we get to be part of it. And He can be trusted in that. What an example Hannah set for us. She shines as an example of the intrinsic worth of a person. You and I must remember our own intrinsic worth. Created in God's image, carefully according to a plan, and extravagantly, way over the top. And not only our own intrinsic worth, but the intrinsic worth of every single person we encounter in this life. Hannah shows us the power of prayer that does not waver. And so you and I must continue to pray and pray and pray, especially over those deep things that we hold close. Bring them to God again and again. 
Hannah exhibited weeping that can become worship. And so we embrace our tears. We weep before the Lord when it's appropriate. We allow the tears to flow when they come naturally in the course of life. And we allow that weeping to become worship to God. Hannah set us a willingness, an example of willingness to surrender her most precious. And boy, I suppose that's the biggest challenge. What is it that is most precious to you this morning? Remember, God said, have no other gods before me. And if we could allow it just to be other gods, I don't have any problem with other gods. But then in the next commandment, he said something about idols. And we've learned idols can be anything that gets between me and God and my relationship with Him. Even good things can become idols. And God will not be second. And so remember, God has given us everything. <clears throat> everything we consider to be most precious. In our willingness to surrender it back to Him, we draw closer to Him. He blesses us. And we open ourselves up to His plan. And we allow Him to do with those precious things what He will do, knowing, even if we don't understand, 